Hello, welcome back. In this video, we're going to delve in depth into different types of investment and their risk and return characteristics. So first, let's take a look at what can you expect to get when you invest your money. So we want to distinguish two components of return. The first is the income component. The important thing about income component is that it's recurring. So this will keep, you'll keep getting this return as long as you own the asset. So for stock, there'll be dividend. If you own a stocks, you will uh, receive dividend provided that the company pays dividend. For bond, you earn interest. Sometimes that is referred to as coupons. So it's just another term to, to remember. So interest on bonds are called coupons. And then mutual funds, oftentimes they'll also pay dividend. Uh, if you purchase a real estate investment, you will receive rental income after expenses. So those are your return. Again, the key for the income component is that income is recurring. In contrast, you also get a capital component. So the capital return component is the capital gain or loss. So this is a one-time gain or loss when you sell the asset. So once you realize the capital gain or the loss, you no longer own the um, asset. So capital gain or loss is equal to the selling price mi minus the purchase price. So obviously, if you sell at a higher price than what you bought something for, you make a gain. So the two together, the capital component and the income component represents your total return. Very important, do not forget costs. So costs are the management fee on investment. Uh, how do we measure return? First, we can measure return in terms of dollars. So the dollar return is simply your dollar income plus your capital gain or capital loss. We're going to use some symbol here. Um, if you don't come, you're not comfortable with symbols, just replace them with words. So we're going to use the symbol D to stands for dividend or interest income. So D is just an income component and P stands for price. And we're going to use T to denote the time period. So the dollar return can be written as dividend, which is your dollar income. So D here is your dollar income plus capital gain. Capital gain is simply remember that is your selling price. So selling price is the price today minus the purchase price. Purchase price is when you bought it. So T minus one simply means last period or last year or last month. And T is today is current. So dollar return simply means the do the dividend or the income component plus this part is your capital gain or your capital loss. Okay. So using the symbol just makes it easier to fit a lot of information into a small space. In addition to dollar return, we can also express return as a percentage. So the percent return is equal to your dollar return divided by the initial purchase price. So the initial purchase price is the price in T minus one. So in the past period. So we can express percent return as R. So R is equal to dividend plus your capital gain. So that's your dollar return divided by the initial price. So we can, we will go over an example to illustrate how this works. In this example, you purchase a stock a year ago for $20. So matching our symbol a year ago is T minus one. So P T minus one. So notice that this is not a subtraction. It's just a notation for time is $20. You receive 50 cents in dividend. So that means D is 50 cents. And then you sold the stock for $22 at the end of the period. So P today is $22. First, let's compute the um, dollar return. So you have an income return of 50 cents, right? So your dollar return is equal to the 50 cents of dividend 
plus capital gain. So how much is our capital gain? We bought the stock for twenty dollars. We sold it for twenty-two dollars. So this is PT. So this is our selling price minus our purchase price. So that will be fifty cents in dividend or income plus twenty-two dollars minus twenty dollars. That's two dollars. That's our capital gain. So we make a total of two dollars and fifty cents in dollar return. Next, we can compute the percentage return. We say the percentage return is the dollar return divided by the initial purchase price. So the dollar return is two dollars and fifty cents divided by initial purchase price. Initial purchase price is twenty dollars. Right, we purchased twenty at twenty dollars a year ago. So we we'll divide this by twenty dollars, and that equals to upon one two five, or twelve point five percent. I encourage you to pause the video and verify that you understand the calculation in detail. All set. Okay, let's continue. So. When you make money, you have to pay tax on the return, and the tax law changes frequently. So、um, instead of giving you the actual rate, I'm gonna use the general. I'm gonna focus on the general category that typically have different tax implications.、Um, there are three types of category. First is the income component. The income component is taxed as ordinary income. So remember, the income component includes dividends、um, and also interest or coupon on bonds. So those are considered income, and they are taxed as ordinary income. The second is short-term capital gain or loss, and this happens when you sell your investment within one year. And then the third component is long-term capital gain. So if you so if you hold on to investment for more than one year, then it is considered a capital gain. So tax tax planning is an important area of financial planning. When we talk about different types of、um, investment options, we will talk about their tax implication as well. While it's important to For, uh, to know how much money or return you can get from investing is equally important to understand the risk associated with investing. So there are different way to talk about risk.、Um, there are qualitative risk, for example, a company specific risk. Some、uh, this can be related to the CEO of the company, or this can be related to a particular product of a company. So liability lawsuits or poor management; those are company-specific risk, and it's difficult to quantify them because it's most、uh, likelihood of what something may happen plus the qual the qualitative aspect of what makes an effective CEO and what makes a distracted or ineffective CEO.、Um, there's also economic risk. This has to do with the general state of the economy. Uh, potential for a recession, potential for inflation, potential for unemployment. Those are economic risk, and then there are also political risk. This is particularly important when we are work、uh, when you're investing in foreign countries. In addition to qualitative description, there are also quantitative discretionary risk. Uh, we can talk about range of return. Range of return means how low can a how low can the return be,、uh, uh, how high can the return be. So in one year you may experience a negative ten percent. So you're losing ten percent of your investment, or you can go up thirty percent of your investment. So that's a range of what are the possible outcome. Uh, those of you who know about statistics, you can also we can also use the concept of standard deviation. So this is on average how far can a particular、um, outcome happen given the probability. So the range of outcome gives you a possible range. Standard deviation augment the range 
with probability. So what are the chances that a stock, a particular stock or the stock market may lose more than 10% in one year. So standard deviation gives you that probability in addition to the range. Uh, you can also use systematic risk uh, in finance that's called beta. The systematic risk describes the relative risk to the market. The market here is the stock market. So a stock or a mutual fund that has a high systematic risk means that it has a higher risk relative to the overall stock market. We also will talk about the risk when you have a range of investments, so a portfolio versus a single asset. Um, we'll focus on the benefit of having a diversified portfolio. So what are some risks that you can expect to face when you invest your money? First and importantly is inflation. Inflation affects all investment, even the low risk investment. Inflation also affects when you don't invest your money because if you don't, if you just put your put your cash underneath your mattress, with inflation, the cash that you put under your mattress will now be able to buy fewer things in the future. So inflation affects all investment, even investment that have very low risk or zero risk. When you venture beyond the very low risk, meaning beyond T bills, beyond CDs then you will take on additional risk. So here are the additional risks that you may take on. Uh, one is interest rate risk. This interest rate risk affects any investment that is long term. So longer term um, investment with greater capital gain component. So again, they don't have any in income component. They have a very high interest rate risk. Interest rate risk means that when interest rate goes up, the prices of these securities will go down. Another one that is pretty clear and obvious is default risk. Um, and you can, ex uh, you can have some estimate of this risk by looking at the credit score of the company themselves. And we will talk about this in more details in a future video. Uh, and then there is overall market risk. If market participant has increased their risk averseness, then they will drive up interest rate and reduce the price of some uh, of the securities. And people's risk averseness can be affected by political and social conditions. So when people are optimistic, they may be less risk averse versus when people are concerned about other things then they may increase their risk averseness and that can lead to a downturn in the stock market. The last risk component is called liquidity risk. In investment and finance, liquidity refers to an, your ability to sell something and turn it into cash quickly if you need to. And the key here is without having to lower the price. So an example is money market mutual fund is very liquid, it's almost like a savings account. Whereas real estate can be very illiquid. If you, if when the market turns south, it can be very difficult to sell a piece of real estate. So these are the major types of risk. So you have interest rate risk, default risk, the risk of the changes in risk averseness of market participants and liquidity risk. Next, let's take a look at the return of investment over time. This graph shows the, the value of $100 invested at the beginning of 1928 all the way through 2022. So the, uh, as you can see, the stock market, the S&P 500, is the one that is most volatile. It goes up and then it goes down and then it goes up again, it goes down. Even though it does go up and down, it's still the highest return, but it definitely has the highest risk because in any given year, you can go all the way up and all the way down. So that is 
relatively risky. Uh, on the other hand, you see that all the other investment, they are less risky, but they also do not generate much return over time. Here's a table that describes the uh, what the pictures show you. So as expected, large company stock has medium risk, medium return, and high liquidity. So we talk about risk, return, and liquidity. Uh, so large company stock, a lot of times uh, in the United States, people refer to that as the S&P 500 or the largest 500 stocks in, uh, traded in the U.S. stock market. Um, and then there's small company stocks. So these are companies that you may or may not have heard of. Um, they have much higher risk, but they also have a much higher return and they are, they are less liquid. Bonds is something very interesting. Corporate bonds are bonds issued by companies. So these are company bonds. They have medium risk, medium low return, and medium low liquidity. Uh, so corporate bonds are not the best investment for, in general, for individual investors. Government bonds, um, they have relatively lower risk. Uh, they don't have, they also have a relatively low return. So here you have low, low risk, low return, and high liquidity. Uh, the longer term bonds have a slightly higher interest rate risk compared to short term bonds. Short term bonds has very low risk, also relatively low return, but very high liquidity. Real estate actually has very low liquidity. We already talked about that. What is interesting is their return and their risk is also medium low. So they don't have a very high return. Uh, their biggest risk is liquidity. And we already talked about that in the chapter when we talk about buying a house. We don't want to buy a house if you think that you'll be moving soon. So mobility is important. The same is true in real estate investment. If you buy a rental property as an investment, if you need to liquidate that, that is going to be a lot harder than if you purchase a stock um, or a government bond and you need, need to uh, convert that into cash. That's much easier. So once again, looking at the graph, what have we learned in the past? First, we learned that large company stocks, um, the average return is a little less than 10% per year. And that is why we oftentimes use 9% as our return when we make assumption about our investment return when we were doing retirement planning. Uh, the long-term average return for the stock market is much higher than inflation and is much higher than the return on bonds and real estate. So in the long run, the stock market is still the best investment. However, stocks are risky. So take that, keep that in mind. Some years you're going to lose money and some years, many years, you're going to make money. But it's important not to forget that you will lose money some years. This is almost a guarantee. Stock investment is risky. So it's important for you to uh, be able to weather those lost years. So meaning that when the return is negative, you're not counting on the investment for your living expenses. And that's why with your emergency fund, you should put that in a liquid low risk investment. So I, so most common is money market fund or a money market account. But for your long-term investment, stock is a much better investment than other options. So even though we say that stock is your best option, remember that they're also risky. So that brings us to a very important concept in finance, and that is the trade-off between risk and return. First and foremost, there's no free lunch. A higher return always comes with higher risk. So what you want to remember is that you're investing, you're not gambling. So it's prudent to take some risk to earn a higher return, but it's not prudent to take excessive risk. So there are known risk and there are unknown risk. So we already know what the risk is investing in the stock market but there can also be unknown risk. The best way for risk reduction is diversification. Um, common sense tells us that don't put all your eggs in one basket, and that's what diversification means, so diversify. The rule of thumb is to have 
at least 30 or more stocks in a stock portfolio. This is very difficult for an individual investor to do, to choose 30 stocks and to have enough money to purchase sufficient quantity of 30 stocks so that you can be diversified. For most inv inv uh, investors, a much easier way to achieve diversification is using mutual funds. So unless you have a lot of money that you can create your own portfolio, mutual fund is a much better vehicle. So as a reminder, diversification can reduce risk and that's why we diversify. So how do you diversify? You can diversify um, across stocks. So the way you do it is you buy stocks in different industries, different sectors. So industry can be healthcare versus automobile versus financial. Um, sectors can be in different geographic area uh, or different countries, and you need a minimum of 30 stocks. So once again, it is not easy to do. Uh, the same is true for bonds. To diversify across bonds, you will want to have bonds that have different maturity, geographically, minis, remember minis are municipal bonds, we'll talk about that, this uh, issued by municipalities. So, so you may want to buy some bonds issued by Massachusetts and some by California and some by Texas and so forth, uh, and also across industries. For real estate, there are different ways to diversify. Again, for stocks and bonds, there are a lot of mutual funds. For real estate, you can purchase real estate investment trust. Um, and we will talk about this as well, equity trust versus mortgage trust. So equity, they actually buy real estate. So you can have a real estate investment trust that specialize in offices, uh, office complexes or condominiums. Um, and you can have mortgage real estate investment trust, mortgage rates, um, trust that buy mortgages. Uh, don't forget your home that if you own a home, you cannot diversify from your primary uh, home ownership. So for most investors, their home is their single largest asset. So they really don't need additional exposure to real estate. So DYI do-it-yourself diversification requires a lot, uh, requires a significant amount of wealth. So let's take a look at the example. Let's say stocks. You want to diversify stocks. We said you need at least 30 stocks to diversify. So let's say you find a stock that's selling at $80 per share, and that's actually relatively inexpensive when it comes to stock. When you buy stocks, you typically buy what in what we call round lots, which is 100 shares. So 100 shares and $80 is $8,000 times 30 stocks is $240,000 to start. So not too many investors have $240,000 to begin their investment. And therefore, mutual fund is a very effective diversification tool for most investors. So now let's put all this together. How do we use investment for you to reach your financial goal? So first of all, be re realistic about your own risk tolerance. Um, most financial advisors and finance websites actually offer um, assessment tools that help you determine what your risk tolerance level is. And this can be done in a survey or a worksheet or um, some kind of questionnaires. So what may affect someone's risk tolerance? Um, job security, if you have a stable job, then you may have a higher risk tolerance, your current wealth level. And this is uh, unfortunate, but the truth is wealth begets wealth because the more wealth you have, the higher your risk tolerance and you can t the more risk you can take, the higher return you can earn. Uh, who is dependent on you, how old you are, and then personal preference. Remember that you know yourself the best. So trust yourself. If you are checking stock price every day and you are losing sleep, then you're better off with a lower risk investment. So if you can uh, buy it and forget it, then you will be ready to take on the, then the investment allocation you have selected is correct for you. 
So once you have determined your risk tolerance, then you want to review your financial goal. So you want to take into account your personal condition, the current economic condition. Consider what sacrifices you're willing to make so that you can meet your goal. And as we did with retirement planning and house planning, specify, specify exactly how much money and now you have the tool to compute exactly how much money and when you need the money to reach those goals. As a rule of thumb, and this is a pretty robust rule of thumb, the higher risk assets are appropriate for longer term goals and low risk assets are for short term goals. So let's take retirement as an example. For most of us, retirement planning is long term, so we can probably invest in much higher risk asset. But as you get closer to your retirement age, then you want to switch to lower risk asset as you reach retirement age. And again, it goes back to our retirement planning example. We use a 9% return for pre-retirement as our assumption. So that will be closer to a allocation of stocks and bond return. And then we use an assumption of 5% return post-retirement, which is a much lower risk and lower return assumption. And you have heard this many times in this uh chapter remember to rebalance again this is very difficult to do but uh, it is very very important to keep you on track to reach your goal the most important thing to take away is that is to know yourself know your own risk tolerance ask yourself can you sleep at night if the market dropped 20 percent and remember that it will come back up The question is, will you be able to sleep while you're waiting for the stock market to come back up? These are important and common topics. So a lot of research has actually been done regarding invest investor behaviors. And that's an entire field called behavioral economics. So here are some of the common biases that can affect individuals' investment decision. And recognizing these biases can help you be a more effective and prudent investor. Uh, one is a regret or loss aversion bias. Uh, what this bias may do is cause investors to hold on to stocks that lose money. Um, you're hoping for it to rebound back. But Again, we are talking about individual stock, not the stock market as a whole. An individual company can and do go bankrupt and go out of business over time. So you may, so again, if you buy individual stocks, you have to be able to overcome these biases. Uh, confirmation bias. So this is hearing things that confirm what you already believe and then you ignore um, news that are contrary to what you would like to hear. And what that hap what that will do is it cause investors to ignore warning signs. So for example, um, uh, inflation may be increasing and that will likely lead to a decrease in stock prices because interest rates are going to go up. But you want to believe that no inflation is not happening. So you are ignoring facts um, and that can be a that can cause you to ignore those signs. Uh, hindsight bias, um, you forget the, the mistakes and only recognize the winning cause. Um, Self-attribution bias, it causes investors to be overconfident instead of recognizing that the, um, the profit they make can be pure luck. They believe that they have um, the ability to choose um, the right investment. Uh, this combined with trend chasing bias, this bias causes investors to buy overvalued stocks. So wherever is the latest hottest stock is what an investor may buy. Familiar bias, familiarity bias. This bias causes investors to underestimate risk. So for example, you may know the name of a business and you say, oh, I know that business, but Knowing the business or recognizing the name does not make that stock a good investment. We're going to stop this video here. 
in the next video, we're going to talk about specific investment such as stocks and bonds. See you soon.